Pakistan needs a leader like Imran Khan, and we were horrified at the U.S. interference and the U.S. hostility towards him and felt that the U.S. was indeed complicit in trying to get rid of a leader that is the most popular person in Pakistan. When Representative McCormick said, I think this is disrespectful and they should ta be taken out, the police then looked around and said, who? Because it was <laughs> just about everybody. We had been to a press conference in which the uh, U.S. ambassador was talking about uh, the U.S.-Pakistani relations, and uh, I got up and said, why are we supporting a dictator? Why are we supporting General Musharraf? I was scared to death at that moment, thinking, you know, right. what's going to happen to us? Because they said, you know, we put Americans in jail uh, for unknown periods of time. In fact, we were saying, we're going to call the embassy. We want to, you know, see. Yeah. And they that's when they stopped and laughed. They said, who do you think ordered us to come and pick you up? Uh, and we said, who? They said, your own embassy. The U.S. Embassy just wanted you trouble causes out of the country. Well, and <laughs> had the embassy know where we were. Strong collusion between the U.S. government and uh, undemocratic leaders in Pakistan, which we know right. has been going on for quite a long time. Pakistan is not a slave of the United States, could make its own independent decisions. Uh, with respect to foreign policy, that really was a, a red line for uh, U.S. leaders who want to control the world. Welcome, this is Nechma Minhas with GVS Dialogue. I wanted to bring someone very special to you today, um, someone who's been an inspiration to me last several months. I've been seeing her actions. Um, someone who's a very bold person, is able to speak back to authority, while the rest of us were si sitting very sheepishly at the congressional hearing on March the 20th, uh, held on Pakistan and democracy there, she was one of those protesters who was led out of the room. Um, I'm joined by Medea Benjamin. Uh, she is the co-founder for uh, Code Pink. And uh, I was just very intrigued about, Medea, your, your interest in Pakistan and this particular cause. So thanks so much for joining me. A pleasure to be on with you. So Medea, what got you interested in Pakistan and, and this cause for democracy? Well, I'm interested in democracy around the world. I spent many years in Africa and Latin America and the Middle East. And I've been to Pakistan a, a couple of times to support the democracy movement, both the, uh, the lawyers movement, uh, when there was an issue about the uh, Supreme Court and the lawyers going on strike. Uh, we went there and camped outside the home of Et Etisan Essen when he was under house arrest. Um, we've supported the uh, the journalists in their efforts to have uh, their the the right of freedom of association, and uh, we also once um, we have been doing a lot of work on U.S. policy in general. And when the U.S. was using drone strikes uh, to kill people indiscriminately in places like Waziristan. We went to meet with the families of drone strike uh, victims, and okay. we also went with Imran Khan to Waziristan to protest the U.S. drone strikes. Okay, interesting. So on this particular congressional hearing, you already had a history of working uh, with Pakistanis on different issues related to Pakistan. Yes, I did. And, and uh, since we had a chance to meet with Imran Khan, to go with him, not only to Waziristan, he took us to one of his cancer hospitals. We met with members of the party, particularly the women's uh, division. Uh, we have a, a history of recognizing that Pakistan needs a leader like Imran Khan. And we were horrified at the U.S. interference uh, and the U.S. hostility towards him and felt that the U.S. was indeed complicit in trying to uh, get rid of a leader that is the most popular person in Pakistan. So why, I mean, I want to ask your thoughts on Donald Liu's testimony, but what, you, you mentioned the fact that you were really hor horrified by the approach that the United States took. Where do you see its complicity, I mean, personally? And why did it take that approach? Well, I feel that uh, particularly since the a Russian invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. has been trying to get its ducks in a row and have uh, the countries around the world siding with it and pulling countries away from any other uh, independent kind of stance. Mm -hmm. And certainly 
uh, when Imran Khan had said that uh, Pakistan is not a slave of the United States, could make its own independent decisions uh, with respect to foreign policy, uh, that really was a, a red line for uh, U.S. leaders who want to control the world. Uh, I think so he said that in response to the EU letter, which uh, rebuked him. Um, so he said that particular statement, which they didn't take very well, as we know that. Um, right. So what were your thoughts on Donald Liu and his testimony that day? Well, uh, I think that Donald Liu was... Uh, uh, trying to uh, clean the slate as far as the, the, the U.S. involvement. Uh, I don't believe a lot of what he said. And, of course, the Pakistanis in the room did not believe what he said with the constant cries of liar, liar coming out from the audience. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what made you protest? Because at some point, at one point, you started protesting as well. Well, I really came to listen to what Donalu had to say, but also to be in solidarity with the Pakistanis who were coming there. And we did not want to take any lead in that, uh, in any kind of protest. But when we heard the Pakistanis speaking out, uh, we certainly felt that it was important for us to join in with them as well. It was quite ironic because we were not the ones that started that, nor were we the loudest ones, uh, right. but we were the ones that were kicked out of the room. Yeah. And you in particular, I mean, Ryan Grimm uh, tweeted that you in particular, you didn't actually say anything at that particular point in time. Um, you were actually still sitting when the protest started. Um, right. I, I was there actually with my hands very quietly. Uh, I had written free um, 804. 804. Right. Yeah. And I will show the viewers that on the screen. I mean, the, that, the, you had the words free 804, which we say prisoner 804, written on your hands. Yes. So I was quiet. I was standing in the back with, with my hands up like that. Uh, and um, yes, it was quite ironic that I was uh, one of the ones kicked out when I really wasn't uh, uh, one of the ones that was shouting. But I must say, that I've gone to many, many, many hearings, and that was very unusual in a hearing because you will find sometimes, you know, we will get up and shout and get hauled out and get arrested, uh, mm -hmm. but we're, you know, one or two or three people in the room. This was almost the entire room. And so it was impossible for the police to know who to take out right, when right. the, um, uh, you know, the disruption is, is, the whole room, I thought at one point they were going to close the whole hearing and have everybody removed, which has happened at, at some hearings. Okay. Uh, but this was very interesting when uh, it wasn't even the chairman. It was one of the uh, yeah, members. Yeah, it was uh, Representative Mc 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 McCormick. McCormick. McCormick, right. Okay. When Representative McCormick said, I think this is disrespectful and they should ta be taken out. The police then looked around and said, who? Because it was <laughs> oh, just about everybody. I was sitting there and I, I was very close to that policeman as well. And he was just shrugging his head and thinking, who do I take out at this point? Um, I found it very interesting, though, that I felt that when Donna Lou made his statement, um, and first of all, he was just reading more or less from that piece of paper. But when he did answer their questions, what I found a bit disturbing was the fact that the congressman didn't counter any of his points. They didn't ask any counter questions to bring up more information or to disagree with him at all. I mean, is that usual in a hearing? Well, I must say that when I was kicked out, I wasn't able to follow what happened during the hearing. And usually in these hearings, there are a couple of people, the more progressive Democrats, for example, uh, who will uh, question them more deeply. But um, I, I don't know in this case uh, who are the ones uh, I, I did. There was somebody, right? Rokana, perhaps. Right. Um, who was questioning more. Oh, and you know, somebody who's bad on other issues but seemed to be good at that hearing was Representative Brad Sherman. Uh, yes, Brad very Sherman surprising. made a very strong point there about selective justice. Um, Greg Cesar made, you know, a couple of points as well. And then Congressman Fluger from Texan made some really strong points about 
the, 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 the ability for Pakistanis to have free and fair elections, and did these take place, where Donald Lude actually came out and said, no, we don't think they are, but that's not very unusual. But we do think if that's proven, then they should have re-elections. Um, there's a dispute over whether he meant total re-elections or just re-elections in those particular constituencies. But there's some strong messaging did come out of that congressional hearing. So you went to that hearing and you you heard what it what they said. But you've been, as you mentioned before, you were in pro protests in 2007 in Pakistan as well. And you got detained and deported from that country as well. So what happened there? Well, this was under Musharraf and... Uh, it was one of the scariest moments of my life. We had been to a press conference in which the uh, U.S. ambassador was talking about uh, the U.S.-Pakistani relations. And uh, I got up and said, why are we supporting a dictator? Why are we supporting General Musharraf? Uh, and um, I think it was Ann Patterson. Was it Ann Patterson? Ann Patterson, exactly. Okay. Ann Patterson, yes. And uh, the next day we were uh, at the... Uh, association of uh, the journalists and a um, car, uh, we were getting a ride with one of the journalists and our car got uh, carjacked, got pulled oh. over um, by plainclothes police uh, a, with guns uh, who dragged us out of the car, took us, um, no, dragged the driver out, took the car speeding along at like 100 miles an hour to an unknown destination. I thought, wow, this is it. Uh, and we, uh, it was a, uh, a, a very um, uh, obscure police station we ended up being taken to and interrogated. And uh, I was scared to death at that moment, thinking, you know, wow. what's going to happen to us? Because they said, you know, we put Americans in jail uh, for unknown periods of time. And, and that can happen to you. They said that to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and what did they ask you? Oh, they were asking us everything about why we had, why we were there, why we had gone to that press conference, what we were doing there, um, all kinds of questions. But the most scary thing came when I, uh, they said, who do you think ordered us to come and pick you up? Uh, and we said, who? They said, your own embassy. No. Yeah. 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 And... Lo and behold, about a half an hour later, somebody from the U.S. Embassy showed up and told us that we were being deported. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Gosh. So the U.S. Embassy potentially, I mean, that's obviously their word for it, that they're saying that the U.S. Embassy just wanted you trouble causers out of the country. Well, and how did the embassy know where we were? How did they well, show up? Yeah. Uh, oh. You know, because they could have called them, right, and said that we've taken two. So how many people were with you? So there was It you? was me and, and my partner, Ty Berry. Yeah. So and two Americans were there. Two Americans, yes. And they had us on the next flight out of there that, that the embassy uh, had already arranged for us to go. They told us that either we get on that next flight or we would be held in prison in Pakistan for an unknown period of time. Oh, my God. So do you believe them when they said to you that... Um, your embassy are the ones who sent us to pick you up? or My you heart sunk when they said that. And I certainly now, after uh, uh, the fact, believe that that is exactly what happened. Because, you know, it was very coincidental that it was the day after that we had interrupted the U.S. ambassador. Right, yeah. But you also mentioned the fact that, you know, why were you supporting a dictator? So potentially there is that room that maybe the dictator was behind that. Um, but that's quite scary as if as an American citizen, you can't rely on your own embassy to protect you in that way. Um, Absolutely. In fact, we were saying, we're going to call the embassy. We want to, you know, see. Yeah. And they that's when they stopped and laughed and said, wow. it was your own embassy. Wow. That's quite, um, and, wow. That's just, well, and I think just, just an me there. yeah, of the, a strong collusion between the U.S. government and uh, undemocratic leaders in Pakistan, which we know right. has been going on for quite a long time. Right, right. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you've just ex you've just shared this very, very scary incident. I can imagine as two people who don't really speak the language, can't understand what's going on, just taken um, and you know taken At to some point, distance. Yeah. Um, 
so, I mean, and then I see, you know, around DC, you're protesting all the time. You're speaking up to people. I've seen you protesting and, you know, Obama speaking, you, you, you speak against him on his policy or, you know, Trump speaking and so on. So how do you do that? I mean, how are you so bold and having this courage? I mean, what do you think gives you that courage to actually, you know, take on power? Well, I'm outraged by my government. You know, I grew up during the days of the Vietnam War. So uh, I learned at an early age when I was in high school that my government lies to me and to the American people in order to get us to do terrible things and to have learned uh, what the consequences of the U.S. war in uh, Vietnam was about, to the millions of people who were killed, the use of chemical agents, the destruction that, you know, the cancer that continues to this day, and then to see it repeated over and over of the U.S. overthrowing democratically elected governments. I lived in places like Guatemala, where the U.S. did that. I've been to Iran, where the U.S. did that. You know, I've been all over the world. I worked for the UN at some point, and I saw time and time again where there was in Africa, Latin America, Asia, the destructive role of the United States. And I feel this tremendous responsibility as a U.S. citizen, especially when countries are trying to do something different or trying to get out of the morass of uh, dictatorial governments, like in the case of Pakistan, and have a chance uh, with a new leader and a, a new era with someone like Imran Khan thinking, you know, this is the time to try to get our government from uh, to stop interfering in the internal affairs. So I think that's a strong motivation mm. to have seen with my own eyes in so many different places throughout the decades, uh, how wonderful attempts when there are huge grassroots movements that manage to successfully bring in democratic uh, governments that provide new hope for people. Um, to see my government destroy them is is something terrible. Mm, exactly. I mean, we've seen around D.C. currently um, in the last couple of months since the Hamas uh, attacking of Israel on October the 7th, you've done and Code Pink has done a lot of positive, I mean, I would say positive work in the sense that you've been protesting, you've been putting congressmen on the spot, uh, Congress members on the spot to ask them about their position on Israel and what's happening in Gaza. Um, and yet you've described yourself as a nice Jewish girl. Do you think your community still see you as a nice Jewish girl, given your work on this issue? Well, certainly there are a lot of wonderful members of the Jewish community that have been protesting and organized some of the most uh, impactful, largest protests uh, in the last couple of months. And so I feel an affinity with that community. Uh, but unfortunately, the majority of members of the Jewish community in the United States continue to stand behind Israel, especially the older generation, people in my generation, uh, who have this uh, lifelong affinity to Israel and are part of groups, pro-Israel lobby groups like APAC, that have been so insidious and done such um, uh, horrific work in supporting uh, pro-Israel candidates and uh, destroying the careers of people in Congress who have professed any kind of concern for the Palestinian people. So uh, there is tremendous division within the Jewish community in the United States. And uh, I think as this goes forward, we see a real generational divide, which is something that gives me some hope. So you see a generational divide in terms of the younger Jewish voters not supporting Israel in that way against Palestinians. Yes, the younger generation doesn't have the kind of uh, uh, deep-seated connection to Israel. Uh, a longer time, of course, has uh, in their lives from the time of the Holocaust, uh, it becomes a much more distant memory and uh, they are more open to looking at the issues affecting Palestinians. And I think, you know, there has been in the Jewish community traditionally uh, a, an uh, affiliation with people who are oppressed. A lot of Jewish people were involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, many people in the Jewish community have been involved in foreign policy issues that uh, are supporting liberation movements. 
It's right. just there's been this blind spot when it comes to Israel. That's why there's this uh, saying, uh, progressive of in everything but Palestine. Right. Uh, but among the younger people who have a chance, whether it's in their uh, college uh, campuses or other experiences to actually meet Palestinians, to uh, learn more about what actually happened in 1948, to learn that uh, there was this tremendous dispossession of the people of Palestine in the creation of the state of Israel. Uh, I think the younger generation has a different view of Israel. What makes you different, though? Because you say you're from that generation who is closer to having, you know, direct relations to people who've come from, uh, who suffered under the Holocaust. So what made you different and see it in a different perspective altogether? Well, I, uh, at um, some point, had traveled with my mother to see her, uh, what might have been left of her family in Hungary. And we went there and found out that the entire family had been wiped out in the Holocaust. So certainly that is something that uh, I have a personal connection to. On the other hand, when I was a teenager, I was sent by my parents at the age of 16 to go live in a kibbutz in Israel to experience that. And I loved the life of the, on the kibbutz because it was very uh, communal. Um, but I realized that there were Arabs surrounding us and the racism of the people in that kibbutz was something that um, uh, affected me. I had been dealing with issues of racism in my high school in the United States where uh, black students had started to come to what was an all white school and there were all kinds of race riots that broke out. And mm -hmm. so I was sensitive to the issue of race and saw the way that the Israelis were talking about and treating uh, their Arab neighbors. And that made me uh, question and start to look more deeply at the issue. And then of course, over the years, I had a chance to go back to Israel and go to the West Bank go to some of the most uh, apartheid uh, villages in the West Bank, um, mm -hmm. visit places like Hebron, uh, and go to Gaza several times where uh, you saw that way before October 7th, all was not well and that people were living under extremely oppressive conditions. Yeah, it's true. Um, so does is there anything about what's happening right now that gives you hope about the future in terms of Palestine, Israel? Well, I th am quite amazed that despite the bias in the U.S. media that really portrays uh, Israel, continues to be portrayed in a lot of the U.S. media uh, as a democracy and as a country that's just trying to defend itself under difficult conditions, yeah. um, that even months ago there were polls like the AP poll that showed that 66% of Americans wanted a ceasefire. And when it came to Democrats, that was 80%. And more recently, there have been polls that's, that show a slight majority, but still a majority, uh, not wanting to send more weapons to Israel. Mm -hmm. And so this gives me hope. It also just shows what a disconnect there is between the American public and what happens in the White House and in Congress. Uh, that they continue to uh, give uh, pretty much unconditional support to Israel, even though the rhetoric might have changed. Uh, so it does give me hope that the American people are questioning uh, the, the U.S. support for Israel, are questioning uh, Israel's response to October 7th. And you do see in the mainstream media, there have been more and more accounts that do show the level of destruction, the uh, horrific starvation now. And I think um, that that does make more Americans sensitive uh, to what's happening and questioning mm -hmm. what our government is doing. What are your thoughts on the TikTok ban? I mean, there's a lot of people who are now saying that this might be related to the way Israel um, is being portrayed on TikTok. Do you agree with that? What What are your thoughts? Or do you because I know that you're against the banning of TikTok? Is that an issue of liberal thought there, or is that an issue of what the portrayal of Israel for you personally? Well, I think it's both, but I think TikTok is now bending over backwards to uh, to uh, show that it is not quote pro Palestine. In fact, I was banned uh, last week on TikTok Live 
uh, from a teach-in that we were having in a congressional office saying that it was hate speech and there was nothing of, of hate speech in there. So I am worried that TikTok, because it's under the microscope now, okay. uh, is leaning in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So a lot of people will say that the kind of um, protest measures that you use, for example, you know, the way you, um, I don't want to use the word harass, but that's the word that is used, that when you go up to these congressmen and you constantly keep talking to them and you are very much in their face as, as it is, um, it doesn't necessarily get your cause any positivity. Um, it doesn't get you any further. Uh, in fact, what you're doing is alienating them and getting their backs up. Do you agree with that? Or do you, I mean, how do you perceive your strategy about how you speak to congressmen about these issues? Well, it depends. I think there are a number of members in what's called the Democratic Caucus that has almost 100, the Progressive Caucus of the Democrats that has almost 100 members. And it is quite remarkable that so few of them uh, in the uh, initial, let's say, two months, uh, called for a ceasefire, and uh, how many of them continue to back Israel. And so I think when we confront those members, it does have an impact because they get embarrassed because those members are being confronted uh, on a regular basis by their own constituents. Mm. And so if it's a combination of uh, the disruptions that happen in the town halls back home, uh, or other ways that local members are flooding the offices of their representatives with phone calls, with emails, or doing even uh, uh, sit-ins in their local offices. When we expose them, uh, that has a, 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 a ripple effect back home. And so I think, uh, I wouldn't say that it's because of us, but we were part of the effort that has led the members of the Democratic um, uh, Congress to move from only 18 members calling for a ceasefire uh, to now about 70 members calling for a ceasefire. When it comes to Republicans, they tend to have uh, their iron ball already set up. They uh, think it's in their interest to continue to support Israel. And I don't think we change them. What we do is expose them and certainly ones who say things like kill them all when it comes to Palestinians or mm. um, question whether there are really Palestinian uh, innocent civilians or continue to uh, parrot the uh, disproven uh, uh, allegations like the beheading of babies. Um, I think it is important to expose them. Madhya, thanks so much for your time today. And I have to say, you are a David in this Goliath battle. and uh, But you're doing a wonderful job for all those voiceless people out there on all these different issues. And we're all very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience. I look forward to doing it again. Me too.